This story begins on the 31st of January 2018. It's a normal recording session for the Whiskey Podcast, or as we call it, Whiskey Podden. Our guest in this specific show is Håkan Stav, the chairman for Roslagen Whiskey Society. He is also a renowned hobby historian within whiskey, and he is here to educate ourselves and our viewers about the timeline of Swedish whiskey production, and more specifically Helsingborg's yeast and spirits factory, which at the time for the recording was believed to be the first Swedish whiskey produced. But there is a problem. No concrete evidence exists. Everybody thought it uh, started with Makmira whiskey. Uh, they started in 1999, in December. Uh, but a few nerds uh, did know that uh, Vino Sprit uh, did start uh, making whiskey in 1955 in Bladnock stills. They bought uh, stills from Bladnock in 1955 and uh, started distilling directly uh, after the, uh, the stills had came here to Sweden, uh, to uh, Söder Tälje. But uh, then Louis Reps, uh, he decided to uh, search about Swedish whiskey history and found a, di- uh, a, a, an old distillery that was called uh, Helsingborg Gäst och Spritfabrik. And they started distilling 1893 and uh, distilled a few, a few years and uh, ended distilling 1901, we think. But uh, direct proof... Uh, uh, we, we haven't a direct proof of that they really did distill uh, Swedish whiskey. Since we are lacking the concrete evidence for that Helsingborg's yeast and spirits factory produced and sold whiskey, I decided to do some research of my own. And I thought, why not start with walking through the sources about Helsingborg? The first and original source is an article from the beginning of August 1892 about that the production will soon start. Swedish whiskey. The Linköping Yeast and Spirits Factory Limited, that recently bought the Helsingborg Yeast and Spirit Factory, has the intention to expand the operation as well as complement the yeast manufacturing with production of Swedish whiskey. If pursued, Helsingborg would be the place for the first whiskey factory in the Nordics. But as I was searching for more articles about the whiskey making in Helsingborg, I ran into something completely different. In an article published on the 18th of August 1892, just 16 days after the first article about Helsingborg, our story took a very surprising change of direction. Swedish whiskey. On the occasion of a journal note headed Swedish Whiskey, wherein mentioned that the Linköping Yeast and Spirits Factory Limited had the intention to let the Helsingborg Yeast and Spirits Factory manufacture Swedish Whiskey, and that Helsingborg then would be the first whiskey factory in the Nordics, factory manager Olsen has notified that the production, according to Scotch standards, has been ongoing since four years at the Gothenburg Yeast and Spirits Factory Limited, Presenten, close to Gothenburg, even if no make from there has yet been released, since whiskey manufactured using Scotch methods must be aged close to five years. Could this be true? Could it actually be so that whiskey had been produced in Sweden since 1888? And what type of proof would I need? I decided to contact Håkan Stav once again in order to get his opinion. What a proof for me is, uh, it's uh, selling records, uh, that, that is a proof, uh, uh, a proof of uh, how much they did get for, for the whiskey, uh, and uh, the, uh, that, that's a proof enough. Uh, but but if, if you can deliver a bottle... It's... Please. (laughs) (laughs) So what I need is some type of evidence proving that whiskey has been sold. And we started out with searching the internet on everything we could find about Gothenburg Gs and Spirits factory. But unfortunate for us, none of the sources could prove that whiskey actually had been sold. But we did learn a lot about the company history. 
Gothenburg Geest and Spirits Factory Limited was founded in 1875. And during all its years, it was located in Mölndal, more specifically on the ground presentum. Expansion of the factory was made as early as 1876, but in November 1884 the factory burnt down and wasn't up and running again until 1885. The company, although located outside of Gothenburg, had its share majority in Stockholm until 1888, when the share majority was transferred to Gothenburg. And soon after, the supposed production of whiskey started, together with cognac and punch, a production that, according to sources, continued until 1909. During the early 1900s, the share majority was transferred to Stockholm Northeast Company, that later on, through different mergers, became what is known as the Geest Company, the largest yeast producer in the Nordics. But this was long after that the factory in Mellendal Gothenburg had been closed. We contacted the Geest Company to see if they had stored some old documents or material related to Gothenburg Geest and Spirits Factory, but the answer was no. Although a very important clue was given to us that we will get back to later on. In order to make our research efficient, we decided to search within four different areas. Books, physical archives, personal archives and museums. But to start with, we took Håkan's advice and contacted Louis Reps in order to understand more about the whisky history in Sweden. Louis Reps has spent years researching whiskey history and is the man behind the webpage glenloshi.com and the book The Whiskey GPS. His expertise is so deep that he can point out the old spirit factories in Stockholm right from his balcony. The reason why I got interested in whiskey history is uh, because the first time I visited a distillery, I fell in love. And the love was spirit safes. And 10 years ago, I bought a spirit safe from Glenlochy Distillery. Uh, And I have it now in my living room. It's a very handy aquarium, water free and free of fishes. Then I got interested about Swedish whiskey history. When, when came whiskey to Sweden? I mean, in Swede, the Swedes were drinking aquavit, brandvin, beer, and this sweet liquor, arak punch. Uh, and whiskey has a stable market share over the years of less than 1% until the end of the 1950s, where it suddenly took off and uh, Today it's the most popular strong drink, strong spirit in Sweden, with almost 40% of the market. We now know that the market share of whiskey in Sweden was very limited in the 19th century. But what did Swedes actually know at the time about whiskey? Did Swedish people know about whiskey? I don't think they knew anything about whiskey until end say 1890, where it's become popular, but only in the upper class. Working people, I don't think, knew anything about whiskey. After informing Louis about Gothenburg's early production of whiskey that I'm trying to prove, I ask him to speculate on why he thinks they decided to produce whiskey. So the question is, why did Gothenburg start to make whiskey? And I think uh, with the whiskey boom, which happened uh, in in, uh, Scotland and due to the fact that uh, this uh, phylloxera came to France, attacking the wine routes and making the production of cognac, wine, brandy in Southern Europe. And then uh, the export of Scotch whisky started, perhaps uh, most in to England, but also to other countries. One uh, one is of course Sweden, and I think for a small distillery like Gothenburg and also the one in Helsingborg, they were very small 
and their main product was yeast. And for them to compete with the big players on the aquavit market in, in Sweden, I think was very difficult. So I think it's logical that they went to products where they can be more or less alone. The only reasonable museum to contact regarding our research is the Spirit Museum, or Sprit Museum in Swedish. The museum is located on Djurgården in Stockholm and has an impressive collection regarding Sweden's spirit's history. Among other things, they have one of the original stills bought from Bladnoch distillery that were used to produce the Swedish whiskey Skeppets. The curator for the Spirit Museum, Eva Lennemann, took interest in our research and dug deep into their own archives until she found an article in a book about the Swedish cheese company that describes the history of the factory in Gothenburg and more specifically the production of whiskey. Although the information found in the book about the production of whiskey in Gothenburg was a bit more detailed than we had seen before, it didn't really give us the proof on that the whiskey had been distributed or sold. But it was one more source that claimed the same thing. Whiskey had been produced in Gothenburg. And we were now eager to continue our search. At the same time that we spoke to the Spirit Museum, we also researched into more books. And in the book Möndal, Kollered and Råda, in words and pictures, we found the exact same story that we already knew, claiming that most of the whisky produced by Gothenburg was reproduced into aquavit. But we still didn't find a real evidence proving that the whisky had been sold. We needed to search somewhere else. But now one more interesting turn of events happened. When we started out our tracks, we also tried to research into the man that worked as the distillery manager, Mr. Olson. Both through official archives such as church archives, but also through personal archives. But we didn't find anything new until we unexpectedly got in contact with some of his old relatives. And although they didn't know specifically much about the production of whiskey in Gothenburg, they knew something much more interesting. They knew where Olsen learned the production of whiskey in Scotland. In early February, I received a message from one of Gottfried Olsen's old relatives. And you can imagine the thrill we got after reading this. Hello again, Carl. I have now gone through the diaries and all other documents that I still have, and I hope that the material that I am sending you will help your further investigation. Attached, you can find various documents that we have in the keep about Gottfried. Also, some financial statements from the 1890s. I could see that the wording whiskey appears in some of the documents, but you are probably a better judge of the material's importance than me. About your specific question about Gottfried's trips to Scotland and if any of the diaries mentions any distilleries, I hope that this will help you a lot. During 1872, according to the diary, he visited 11th to 17th of April, Paltony Distillery in Wick, 19th to 24th of April, Milburn Distillery in Venice, 26th of April to 2nd of May, Glen Scotia Distillery in Campbelltown. Please let me know if there is anything else you acquire. Best regards, Thomas. We were eager to find out what Olsen did learn in Scotland and even more important, what style of whiskey was he trying to produce? And this takes us into a new part of the documentary, our walk in the footsteps of Mr. Olsen in Scotland. His first stop was Pultney Distillery in the old town of Pultney Town, today part of Wick. We can only imagine what his first impression looked like when he arrived here in 1872, but if he came by boat, which is what we believe, the experience must have been overwhelming as he arrived in the harbour. The harbour really was what uh, made Wick in as, as terms of its fishing heritage. Fishing, the fishing actually began here in a small uh, harbour out to the north of Wick in a place called Staxigo. Uh, there were some entrepreneurial fishermen began life fishing there, recognised the potential of the herring fishing. But it became, uh, the stacks ago wasn't really sufficiently sufficient size to actually um, 
contain what was a potentially large industry. And the British Fisheries Society came along and built Pulteney Town, which is the, the town around the harbour, built the harbour and the town and all the buildings around here. So they were all built specifically to encourage and build the fishing industry. So the harbour has always been a focal point of Pulteney Town. Ian Leith is the chairman of the Wick Society, a society that, among other things, runs the Wick Heritage Museum, that has a display on how life was during the heyday of the herring fishing. And it gives us a feeling of how life was in Pulteney Town and Wick around the time when Olson visited. Life, life was hard in many respects. The, the, the life of a fisherman was a difficult life. He had to go to sea. Uh, some of the seas were pretty rough. There's been lots of shipwrecks. Like people were lost at sea quite a lot. But I think in some respects the hardest work were the fisher girls, the gutter girls, uh, that had to gut the fish as they came in. It was a difficult job in difficult circumstances. You were working in salty water, you had to gut fish very quickly because these gutter girls were uh, paid by the the barrel. Uh, So the more they did, the better uh, they got paid. So the work was, was hard. The best of them apparently could gut 40 herring per minute. Uh, and that was quick, uh, but they were using a sharp knife, um, so probably a few cuts on the fingers were, were the results of that. And you were working in salt water, so you can imagine if you've got a nick in your finger from a knife and then you're putting your hand in salt water. There's yeah. so, so, so that was the sort of working life, which was a hard life, but uh, the town itself uh, increased in numbers considerably during the fishing season because people came from all over. Not only the fishing boats came from all over, but also the, the, the fisher girls would come uh, from the west coast of Scotland. They would walk over here hundreds of miles to be part of that. And that increased the population. This map shows how Wick and Pulteney Town looked like during the time when Olsen arrived. The Pulteney distillery is located on the south side of the harbour and the question is... How much has the distillery changed until now? How did the distillery look in the 1870s is a very good question and very interesting in the fact that, to be honest, it wouldn't really have changed much from what it is today. Uh, We've grown up a wee bit in terms of uh, some warehousing, but the actual plant area itself, uh, we are very constrained by the town. Uh, We can't grow out, so we go up a wee bit. So we've probably grown up a level, but the footprint of the distillery is very much the same. Uh, the construction of the buildings hasn't changed much. Uh, you go in around the plant, it's a rabbit's warren. A lot, of the, a lot of the doorways are very low. They haven't been raised. They were very small in those days. Uh, I'm five feet nothing, and I still bang my head on the doors. But really, it hasn't changed much at all, uh, other than an addition of a couple of new warehouses. There would have been six pots in those days. It wasn't until the earliest 20th century that we or they took a view to increase the capacity of the distillery, and they took out the six smaller pots and replaced them with two. But I'm led to believe, and I've read, that it's a, they're a direct copy of what they were. So they were much, much smaller than six of them. So you would have three wash stills and three spirit stills. But now we've got uh, one of each. The style of whisky we made in the 19th century was like a lot of distilleries in Scotland at the time. We had our own maltings. So... <clears throat> The whisky would have been very peated. Uh, it was grown locally, and uh, taken in on site and, and malted here and, and distilled. So you would have had something very peated, not unlike our probably our, our currently our 1990 vintage that's on the go. So it would have been probably matured in a lot of these sherry casks as well. So it would have been have the influence of the sea, the influence of the maritime, the coastal expression. You would have the phenolics going on there and you would have all the kind of chocolate, kind of uh, clove aspects going on as well with the, with, the, with the influence of the sherry. I suspect Godfrey came to Pulteney in the 1870s. I mean, they, in those days, it was, you know, it was the centre of excellence, the Scotch whisky industry. We were in boom years. You know, for 20, 30 years, uh, the whole industry was booming. Uh, Wick is a seaport, and possibly, you know, he would have obviously come over by, by boats. Wick being, in those days, was the principal herring port in Europe. There was a lot of fishing. Uh, he possibly could have come over and ended up in Wick by schooner. And having 
Pulteney, not just Pulteney Distillery in those days, there was other distilleries within Caithness as well. So there was a small concentration of distilleries. There was a route in, there was a route out. Uh, there was a knowledge bank. Uh, there was good eating. There was good drinking and lots of it. So possibly that could have been a draw for Gottfried to come to work at those days. You know, I mean, four days learning really at a distillery, you know, you get to, you know, you can get the flow of how things are. Uh, I suspect, you know, he's probably had a small knowledge or a knowledge of something in the art of distillation prior to his visit. So I think what he would have been doing is coming across on kind of like a fact-finding mission, uh, the idiosyncrasies of, of, you know, certain places on what it's going to lend to a certain style of whiskey. So he, he would have had his knowledge coming across, I, I suspect, but he really wants to kind of create something that's a bit different by visiting other distilleries and what he can, what he can do to influence his style of whiskey that he wants to produce. So being coastal and where we are, uh, he probably liked the style, and he's come here not so much to learn the process, but to find out what we do that influences the style that he likes of what would have been Pulteney whiskey in those days. Since Milburn in Inverness is no longer active, we decided to move ahead all the way down from Wick to Campbelltown to find out what he did learn at Glen Scotia. I'm here to talk about Gottfried Olsen, um, who's obviously the founding father of the Swedish whisky industry. Gottfried visited Scotland between 1872 and 1882. And in that time period, he visited Old Pulteney, Melbourne and Glen Scotia Distillery in Campbelltown. Um, Campbelltown at that time period would be at its zenith. It would be at the height of its, its power. Uh, it would be a sight to behold. Whiskeyopolis, Victorian whisky capital of the world. Unique place for the size of Campbelltown, it would be a sight to behold. Um, you obviously have 35 different distilleries. It's came and went at any one time period you would have 26 distilleries operating at the same time, which is quite phenomenal when you consider the size of the place. Um, Glen Scotia. Glen Scotia basically started in 1832, so it would be well established the time Godfrey visited us. Um, and that was obviously the raft of first distilleries which came along after the, the excise acts and legalisation, then obviously it would be the the first of the modern distilleries, if you understand, basically when you think there was illegal distilleries before that and, you know, there's a lot of skullduggery going on before that. So that, that, that would be the, the, obviously the start of the new period. So 1832, Glen Scotia started, um, the time Godfrey got here, 1872, 1882. Then there would obviously have been, as I say, in full production. Godford would obviously came here, came to Glen Scotia. What he would see at Glen Scotia would be this roughly the same setup as it is today. It's slightly opened up more than it was then. It would be a, a, a maze of alleyways and passageways with a lot of woods and wooden buildings and there'd be coopers on the go and there'd, there'd be a lot of trades to and and fro at that time. Um, but it's, as I say, it's, it's, what what you see is pretty much what you you would get then. Uh, again, it would be it would be smoky, it would be dusty. You know, there would be, there would be a lot a lot going on production wise then. Smaller scale, yeah, smaller scale. But again, it would be it would be really really interesting to see how the exactly they made that new make spirit in that latter half of the nineteenth century. Both Pulteney and Glen Scotia, among with our experts, agree upon that the whisky that Olson was trying to produce probably was peated. So we can assume, both from Pulteney and Glen Scotia, that the whisky probably had a touch of sea combined with smoke. Our trip to Scotland was amazing, but we did not find evidence on that the whisky had been sold there either. But as mentioned earlier, we did get a clue from the Swedish cheese company that we now shall explore. The last and final track of this story. The clue we got from the G's company was that part of their archives had been transferred to Solentuna municipality. 
I contacted them and they assured me that all the archives were still there and that we could go through them together. The archives consist of mostly financial statements and annual reports, which is exactly what we have been looking for. Hopefully one of them did have a statement about whiskey. And it did. Finally, after three months of search, we had the evidence we needed. In one of the annual reports, the broken down financial statement clearly shows how much that was earned from whiskey during that year. And here it is. Gothenburg Geest and Spirits Factory both produced and sold whiskey, more than 60 years ahead of Wien and Sprit. I'm very thrilled about uh, Sweden making whiskey in the 19th century. Uh, it's uh, like finding a, a golden nugget or something. It's uh, very, very exciting. And uh, it's uh, li- like uh, if, if you are... Uh, a Star Wars nerd and waiting for the next film and then you have discovered that oh they made three films I haven't seen before they, that golden nugget uh, is uh, this that uh, they, they made whiskey in Sweden in the 19th century so as I say it's quite a, quite a subject and it's a subject you could obviously spend a long time chatting about and you could really put a, a fantastic um, description together about him. You know, he sounds a fantastic guy, he sounds a very go-ahead guy, and he sounds uh, really innovative, to say the least. Obviously, what he achieved is quite uh, quite amazing. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's fantastic, as I say, fantastic, the, the whole aspect about him, the way he went about it. I'm delighted, absolutely delighted. You know, you know, as I mentioned earlier on, you know, the association that we have now with Sweden and Old Pulteney, and uh, you know, you can you can rewind, you know, a hundred odd years and, and find that association was there then, and uh, it's heartwarming. I'm absolutely over the moon. You know, when you, you know, I found out that you know there was that association way back in the 1870s. It's uh, it's fantastic, it's fantastic. You know, people change, but obviously people's uh, thoughts and attitudes towards something obviously hasn't changed in that respect. Even though we might never find a bottle of the whiskey that Gothenburg produced and therefore never know how it tasted like, it is quite clear that Sweden was a pioneer of whiskey already in the 19th century and that whiskey is in our veins. The Swedish whiskey history has been rewritten. We now know that the first whiskey produced and sold in Sweden belongs to the Gothenburg Geest and Spirits Factory. The exceptional news that uh, Gothenburg uh, created the first Swedish whiskey uh, in the 19th century, um, I'm flabbergasted to be honest. It's, uh, we all knew that there was something before Sjöppets whiskey. Uh, we thought it was maybe Helsingborg, but we had no proof. And now, uh, with this piece of news, with this uh, uh, exceptional revelation, uh, we, um, I mean, I myself stand corrected and uh, as the professor of Whiskey Podden, that doesn't happen very often. So uh, what does this mean for Sweden, for Swedish whiskey? It's uh, a new chapter in the Swedish whiskey history. And uh, I'm very excited to see if uh, time will tell more about this uh, story, if we will find more evidence, uh, more traces and tracks of this uh, production in Gothenburg. Uh, well, so um, basically for me this is, um, this is the biggest news I've heard since I started uh, int- uh, my interest in whiskey. The question is, where do we go from here? Will we be able to find any more evidence around the story? Well, will we be able to find a bottle? We don't know. But what we promise you is that we will continue our research into Swedish whiskey history. And we hope that the future will bring us even more answers and stories. This is the first time that we have rewritten the Swedish whiskey history. But we hope that it's not the last. (laughs) 